Okay, we are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Braving Innovation. My name is Nada Ahmed, and I am an innovation strategist and startup advisor. And um, in this podcast, I bring to you inspiring stories, tips, and strategies from leaders all around the world so that you can excel on your journey as an entrepreneur, innovation leader, and investor. Today, I'm really excited because I have a very special guest on here with me from Austin, Texas, Kyle Nell. Kyle Nell is the president of Singularity Labs at Singularity University, and he is the former CEO and co-founder of Uncommon Partners, a transformation company which was acquired by Singularity University in 2019. He is the co-author of Leading Transformation, a best-selling Harvard Business Review press title, um, which was he wrote in 2018. And he is a behavioral scientist and has designed um, a multidisciplinary behavioral transformational approach, uh, which uses tools like na uh, narrative and applied neuroscience to help organizations break out of incrementalism. So I'm really excited to dive into these topics, um, particularly around how do we transform, especially as big corporates, um, as you have a lot of experience of, on working from inside in, in a lot of these corporations, but also as you consult and advise on them. And um, I'd love to hear also a lot more about the cool projects that you're working on right now and today. So um, to get started, um, the, tra tra the tradition at Braving Innovation is um, to ask my guests, um, tell us about a time where you had to either face a difficult situation, um, a make a difficult decision in which you had to really muster a lot of courage and be exceptionally brave. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the, there's a bunch. <laughs> the one that comes to mind is, um, you know, in 2018, uh, 2017, actually, I, you know, I had been, I started the Lowe's Innovation Labs, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, and um, founded that and grew it to be a pretty large and fairly, you know, uh, well-regarded institution. We built all pretty, a lot of wild and exciting things. We were first to just about everything, VR, AR, um, using it for big traditional uh, organizations. You know, we built exosuits for employees. We put a 3D printer in space for crying out loud. And I had an amazing team. And um, But I kind of had gotten to the point where it was just becoming uh, routine and it was getting kind of dull. And I didn't feel like it was pushing it very far. And in our family, we have family goals, and which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. It's driven by a, by a narrative about what we want to do as a family. And it wasn't helping where what we were doing now wasn't helping us get to those family goals. And, and so um, my wife was gently nudging me that it was probably time to make a change. And I was just really happy. Everything was going great. I was getting paid really well. Everything was good. Um, and, uh, but I, I also knew it was time to make a change. And so I made the decision to leave. Um, when we were at the top of our game, everything was going great. And it was hard. I, I, it's, a lot of people asked me what I was doing. They said it was ridiculous that I would leave um, because I had an enviable position and things were going really great. Yeah, but, but I'm glad I did. It was hard. And leaving right after leaving was not easy because we had to start. I started something from scratch with my uh, co-founder, Amanda Mana, who was, who was at Lowe's with me. Um, but we started from scratch and we built something great and then it got acquired really fast. And uh, that's been exciting. So I think the, the hardest thing not the hardest thing, but one of the things that comes to mind is, is leaving when things are good um, mm. and not just waiting for them to get bad uh, before people depart. I, so many times I hear from folks that are like, oh, I hate my job and oh, I hate this. Well, you're in my view, you're well past the time you should have left by the time you hate your job. Absolutely. Uh, you should leave when things are good. Yeah, no, uh, that's that's a great story. And I think a lot of people can relate to that because it's very easily, especially if you do love your job to kind of get stuck in there um, and make that decision to maybe step outside your comfort zone. And the thing that scares people the most is what, at least what they've told me when I quit my job, is the uncertainty, right? Like, will you be able to reach the same high again? A lot of people have said to me, especially men, they're like, well, you know, now that I have um, a lot of financial responsibilities 
and I have to remind them that so do I. <laughs> um, but also that, um, that, you know, like I've climbed the ladder. I'm here where I am. I'm just afraid, like if I quit now, if I try something different, would I be able to get to where I am again? And, um, and I think it really comes down to believing in yourself and just having that faith and, and trust that, yeah, you made it, you made it this far once, like, why can't you do it again? Totally. And, and the other thing too, is if it doesn't work out, that's okay too. You're going to bounce back. You're going to try something else. You're going to figure something out. Not everything's going to work out, but, um, like you said, if you're, if you've got the right mindset and the right attitude, you can just kind of figure it out along the way. I mean, who could have guessed all of the craziness that's happened over the past three years? No one could have planned for that. No Absolutely. one. So, Absolutely. so, yeah. so you just got to be resilient and, and, and really have your goals fixed. The other, the other part that I find a lot when I talk to people and even myself, when things start to fall off the rails, you're not really doing what it is that you are here on this earth to do. You know, making money seems like a great goal, but at a certain point, additional, you know, 10% or 20% your salary is not going to change your life. But what would change your life is maybe doing something that's more core to your mission and to why you feel like you're here on this planet. And we don't have very much time on this earth. So no. what are we going to do? Make another, you know, couple hundred thousand dollars or a couple million bucks. Or we're going to do something that matters. Yeah. Um, Dave, David Brooks is a pretty famous author. He, he wrote a, a, a great book, but in, in that book, he, he's talked about, uh, when you die, it's an offset thing, but he, I think he said it well, which is there's, there's two kinds of things. There's resume information and then there's eulogy information. And I, and I think about that too. Like, am I doing this? Not everything is a eulogy, but you should be working a lot of, in my view, a lot of, on things that should be read at your eulogy. Not, mm -hmm. I grew ARR by 40% year over year, but that's, no one's going to care about that. They're going to care that you did something that was meaningful to people mm. and, 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 uh, and meaningful for your family. And if those things yeah. don't jive together, part of that could be providing for your family, but if they don't come together, people just get unhappy yeah. and they hate their lives. And that's not a way to spend it, in my view. Yeah, and that's that's so true. And I think in a lot of the surveys that are coming out now, trying to understand the great resignation and why people are resigning. So the big chunk of people who are resigning are sort of people who worked for 10 years, sort of in their 30s, in their 40s, who are just now saying, you know, we've we've gone through two, three years of a lot of uncertainty. Right. Um, right. And they've, they've spent a lot of their career sort of doing what everyone tells them to do. And, and now they're ready to take some bigger risks because they're a little bit more established, a little bit more confident in what they can do. Um, and that's kind of where I found myself that, mm -hmm. you know, now is the best time. It's still, it's still not too late. And in terms right. of like exactly what you're, think, you're saying about like when you're on your deathbed, what are the kind of things that you want to talk about? Like I want to be able to talk about the big risk I took, I mean, which in the grand scheme of things is not so big, but maybe it led to something <laughs> way more transformational, right? And just giving yourself that opportunity, why not do that? So um, let me also start off by asking you, um, since you mentioned Lowe's um, and the really impressive work that you were able to do there in a short period of time. And in 2018, when you were working there, Lowe's was um, on the Fast Company's 2018 Most Innovative Companies. It also won the award um, of Fortune 2018 uh, World's Most Admired Company. So they definitely made a lot of strides uh, in terms of innovation. So if you could talk us through a little bit around what you did there that was so transformational that a lot of other companies were not doing at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. No, so uh, it, uh, the short version is, um, you know, behavioral scientists, I really wanted to study how people make decisions, but I wanted to apply that. And in the real world, I didn't want to just sit in an academic office somewhere writing papers, nothing wrong with that, but that's not the way to affect change. And, um, and so I had an option. I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, amazing, amazing program. I was, uh, I thought I was gonna be a lifelong marketing researcher. I love market research um, and the art of it and understanding uh, how people make decisions and being able to use like real true qual and quant to really understand that. So hats off to like the really, really great market research out there. They don't get a lot of love. Um, but the when I was there, I started to experiment with different things and, and different methodologies. And what I found was the the methodology that I was being taught to communicate information 
was in my MBA program was what every MBA program switches, which is like to be concise, to be data driven and to be bullet point focused in like a PowerPoint format. And the basic social contract, which no one really says out loud, but it's, it's implied, is that the most rational, best thought will win. And that if somehow you can convey the best idea that then magically the management team will just do it. And that's just not how the world works. And what I found was, so it was less about conveying information in a concise way. The real goal should be behavior change. And again, the social contract of the business meeting is that I'm going to come with my rational thought. You are going to come with your pre-existing plan as a management team. And then, you know, we should battle it out in the battles of ideas and then whichever one wins we should do. And that's pretty, that's kind of how it is, but it hardly ever really works out that way ever. Um, yeah, because most people so don't fun. make decisions based yeah. on, um, sorry, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you, but like most no, people no, no. don't make decisions based on logic, but it's actually emotions that drive most of our decisions. And I think people don't 100%. understand that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. We all do. I mean, I do. That's, I study it and I still make emotional decisions. Emotions are not bad, by the way. They're incredible. Um, it's our, it's our cheat code for, to be able to get stuff done. We got to be rational about everything. We never get out of bed. Um, it's too many decisions to make. But anyways, I digress. Um, but the but so what I studied was I studied how people really make decisions, and I started reading all kinds of different books that were outside of um, outside of the core coursework, and I started to investigate different things and get into applied neuroscience and all kinds of things. And I had this amazing professor that was um, that was on loan for a year. Um, his name's Torsten Ringberg, and now he's at uh, Copenhagen Business School. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful professor. And he is a true expert in deep qualitative methods. Anyway, studying how people really like what get, getting beyond how people think they think, but to how they really they make decisions. Anyway, so he turned to me on all this stuff. And basically, long story short, um, I could prove it in a thousand different ways after I've done a bunch of studies myself, which is that storytelling is the only way that I found that people really ingest new information. So if the first thing is you have to get over all the biases and hurdles so that people can accept and receive new information, right? And then you have to then go, it has to go into the cauldron of your brain to be able to sift it out and say, okay, do I make a change based on this new information? Now, we as a people have gotten very good at building up walls on, on, in, on bringing in new information. That's good too, actually, but, but it, it makes it hard. And, and you know, I, we can talk wax philosophical about the politics of today, but how do we, how do we get into the cauldron? How do we make the change? And it's storytelling. It's storytelling. And then what was so shocking to me is in my business school, which is a great, it's an amazing school, but the way that business talked about storytelling was such a, like a, uh, it was so dismissive. It's like, oh, well, just write the story in the headline of your PowerPoint and that it should all contiguously be a story. That's not a story. A story has characters, it has conflict, it has a narrative arc. And, um, and so all of these things I was seeing were playing out in the brain as I was doing EEG scans of people while they're making decisions and then also tracking them to see how they change their behavior. If people were given the same knowledge or the same information in story, story form, they were less likely to agree with you in the room than bullets, but they were more likely to agree, to actually change their behavior. So basically what we've designed is a whole generations of business leaders that are really good at getting with getting people to agree with you in the room. So we've all been in those meetings where people are like, yeah, that's right. We should do that. And then they leave, walk out of the room and nothing happens. And that's because the mechanism is incorrect for how we actually operate as humans. And so I decided I was going to try in my naive state to try to weaponize in a good way um, uh, storytelling. And I figured I thought I had this grand unified theory for how strategic what I call strategic narrative plus neuroscience um, could plus all the traditional tools like Lean Startup and all those things could really play inside of traditional organizations. Because I worked in nonprofits, my wife and I lived in the jungle in Costa Rica and worked for a nonprofit, which is a fun story for another day. But so I had done all that and I really realized that the only way this world is going to change in the way that I want it to change is going to be at traditional organizations, traditional companies like Lowe's um, will, would actually stand up and make some changes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. So how do you unlock it? And so I, I created this whole system of how to do it and somehow uh, warmed my way into the affections of the senior leadership at Lowe's and they let me do it. And it worked very well. I mean, all the things that Lowe's built, uh, that Lowe's Innovation Labs built was a direct uh, outcome of that. And then, um, and, then, and then left and did that, started doing this for other companies. And now that's what Singularity does in addition to a 
a wide variety of other things we actually build stuff uh, too. But anyways, it's all driven by this narrative first approach. And mm -hmm. um, it's always so interesting to me to, for me to ask executives, which I'm often called to do, is to say, what is your strategic narrative of your company? And people, they will, these super senior executives of Fortune 500 companies will look at me completely blank face. I have no idea. Hmm. So what do you tell people like in, at a cocktail party? Like, what do you tell, what do you say to people? Like, you can't tell, give them, you can't say like, oh, we're going to grow by 40 basis points this quarter. That's not, doesn't, that doesn't get people out of like excited to come to work or to join your company yeah. or state your company. Yeah. So anyways, but stories do, stories do. Yeah. No, that's um, that's really powerful. And when you and and just for people who maybe don't know Lowe's, it's a home improvement um, right. retailer, uh, mm -hmm. huge in in the U.S. next to Home Home Depot. Mm -hmm. um, and w so, when you're building these narratives, are you building them for the senior management? Are you building yeah. them for the customers? Who is it for? Yeah, you can have different. Great question. You can have it from different angles, but. Um, Primarily what we're doing is the focus is replacing the strategy document or amending it to be the, the strategic narrative being the base. And then all of the other pieces are just addendums to it. So the, the first focus is on the senior management. And one of the things I, 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 I always say is that I really dislike the whole customer first idea. I like the idea. I hate the phrase. And the reason why I hate it is because again, it's based on this somehow this very naive and untrue notion that if somehow it's good for the customer, the organization will naturally just do it. That just doesn't happen. Your first customer is you, whoever it is you have to convince to make that change so that then your idea can live and thrive. And so you can't worry about the customer facing stuff. That's great, but that's secondary or tertiary to getting stuff through your organization doesn't matter if you're a 10 person company, they have the same problems that a, you know, a two, a 300,000 person company has. It's just exacerbated because they won't. Yeah. Be I mean, that is so true. Having worked in big corporations for many years and trying to drive these transformations right. and you know, always focusing on that narrative of like, yeah, let's find out what the customers want. We are too inward focused. Let's focus on the customers. And then not realizing that as a transformation team, as an innovation team, one of our biggest jobs is to influence the leadership, to convince them, because often they don't know what the trends are and they don't know what the market trends are. So what tools are we going to use to get them on board? Because without that, without being able to convince them to give us the resources to actually implement something transformational that is not just incremental change, you have to get them on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. um mm. It's, it's, a, it's a very important point. Um, and so you mentioned that you were able to uh, get the first 3D printer uh, into space mm -hmm. uh, at Lowe's. And what does mm -hmm. that 3D printer do for them? Why was that yeah, that so important? You can, yeah, you can, go, you can go and look on the Google, Google images, or not Google images, but the Google map of the International Space Station. It's still in there. Uh, still makes... Uh, makes tools and it makes still parts works. for the so works for the for the International <laughs> Space Station. Things break all the time, um, and you can't uh, you can't just like go to the store to get one. So it's the store. Um, so the first commercially manufactured thing off the planet is a Lowe's wrench, uh, specially made for the for the astronauts, which is pretty oh, exciting. Wow. wow! The idea being that the astronauts like and we've learned this, you know, as long as we've had astronauts and even explorers. What's what works if it works in space people that are in space have the same problems as people on earth they're just bigger and more extreme right um and so if you can solve it in space in the international space station you can solve it here on earth and um a lot of again a lot of these same problems exist almost all of them actually and so mm -hmm. getting stuff when you need them um, without a lot of waste uh, is really important so for instance you know, a lot of things on the International Space Station are old uh, and they break. Well, what happens mm. if something important breaks or even something not important breaks? What do you, what do you, ha what do, you do? You have to wait, call down to NASA and you have to mm. wait for the next possible shipment, which could be months or years away. And mm. what if it's super critical? Well, what do you do? You're totally out of luck. And that's a bad problem when you're orbiting the Earth. What happens when we try to go to Mars? What happens Absolutely. when we try to... We, we really colonize the moon. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things there where we can't just be going back to earth every two minutes. 
And, uh, and so we have the same problem here on earth, but it's just less big, right? We're expending, if you look at the proportion of how much waste there is in any mm-hmm. warehouse, especially a parts warehouse, um, like at a Lowe's when I was there, we had about 80% of the items were small items. So like if you looked at like the total number of items, most, the total number, 80% were actually small items, like, like uh, little screws and all of the different iterations of screws and little plastic parts and things are there just, just in case, right? Yeah. The velocity on those were very, very low. So there's so mm. much waste in that space there, just hoping that one day it would be good for the customer in case they need that one little random part. But mm. even then, even with all that selection, there's still so many things that have to be special ordered or brought in from somewhere else and still doesn't mm. serve the, the customer. So what if you mm. could shrink all that down? So that was the idea. If we could do that mm. on space at the quality required for an international space station, you could replace any part on a refrigerator, no problem. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, absolutely. And you don't have the luxury of having like all that inventory available to you in, the, in space, right? You don't have space in space no, you uh, don't. in your space station. So... Yeah. So, I mean, so there, you know, that's a real example of like the impact that you were having of the innovations that you were doing um, in, in Lowe's and, and then things like the AR VR technology for people to be able to actually envision what kitchens are, can look like for them if they renovate them, et cetera. Were you able to then directly connect that to higher sales, more revenue 100%. for Lowe's? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I can't talk about the exact numbers because it's yeah. still... <laughs> NDA, but yes, because, 100%. Because one of the things that, you know, we get pressed really hard on in corporate mm-hmm. is KPIs, like re- return mm-hmm. of investment. Can you mm-hmm. show me the return of investment? And often the yeah. time horizons for these can be really long. So it's not mm-hmm. like you can tell them by the end of the year, you're going to be, for in some instances, right? But here you were able to do that in retail, for example. Yeah. It's one of the things that it's part of the, 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 the big pieces of, of my book, which is, one of the things you have to have is a strategic narrative followed by future KPIs. So one of the biggest mistakes that organizations make is they use mature metrics to judge something in its infancy. Um, and if you, if you use like, and usually it's sales, right? So everyone's like, well, this thing that you invented three minutes ago, how come it's not as big as this? It's like, well, cause it's new. Um, but so if we, but it doesn't mean that it's good new, there's good new, there's bad new. But we need other measures to be able to see if something's good or bad or not. And good or bad meaning should we invest in it? Should we sustain it? Should we should we maybe supplant it with something else or vice versa? And I, you know, there's poor Kodak is always taken behind the woodshed and beat up um, for 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 inventing the digital camera and then now becoming a shadow <laughs> of itself. But one of the reasons, if you really go back to why they decided to they invented the digital camera, but the way that that story is usually told is like one day they're like, oh, we just invented a camera like on a lunch break. No, no, no. They spent, they had teams of people working on it. They spent millions of dollars. They spent years developing the digital camera. So it wasn't an accident. They were doing it on purpose and it, they were really dedicated to it. But the reason why they decided, one of the reasons they decided to like not really keep going with it was because they were using mature metrics to compare it to. They were looking at the paper and chemicals business and the resolution of 35 millimeter cameras and comparing it to this like little nascent digital camera and the cost cost there. But if they were looking at something else that may be uh, image improvement year over year, then you would see the digital camera and then the cost per whatever, however their pixel or whatever they were choosing to compare it to the 35 millimeter, you would see very quickly that the digital camera was going to blow the blow blow out all of the numbers um, for for Kodak and for for imaging very quickly. But mm-hmm. they again, they were looking at the paper and chemicals business and they were looking at the dollars coming in. And that's it, what gets people in trouble. Exactly. It's like what you're comparing it to, you know, like when Uber went out to get in um, get some investors on board, they were comparing it to the current ride uh, ride sh- not wasn't ride sharing, but like the taxi market, right? Exactly. Like the cabs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was completely different from the market that they're assessing now, which are just anybody who wants to go from anywhere uh, right. from A to B. So it's really what you're comparing it to. Um, and then, you know, when you went on your own after Lowe's and started Uncommon Partners, um, what was what, what did you mean by Uncommon Partners? Because you also, also talk yeah. a lot about that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. That's one of the key things, too, that uh, was in my original like uh, wild thesis was that if you want to do something different, you have to work with people you wouldn't normally work with. 
<laughs> and you can't just and and this goes back to all the social science stuff. If you go back through history, or if you look at how any big changes have made, it's usually through some sort of disaster or war <clears throat> that forces this to happen, or extreme competitive environment. But you get these interesting bedfellows. You get these people that in organizations that normally wouldn't work together that are forced to work together because it's survival, and then they end up doing much more than they possibly could uh, separately. But mm. it's not, it can't be a transact, all the research is very clear. You don't get as much out of it if it's just a transactional relationship. If you treat somebody or another organization like an employee, not an employee, but as a, as a vendor or vendee, um, mm. you're gonna get uh, not, not the results you want. That works fine if you're just buying software somewhere and you don't care about building or, or iterating. But in the innovation process, as you well know, there's so much unknown and you have to iterate with each other. And a key part of iteration is communication. And if mm. you're not treating each other like partners, you know, like mm. think about, you know, your spouse, right? Or your significant other, you say things to each other that are uncomfortable in the moment because you love them enough to say, honey, you look ridiculous. You're not going outside the house, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But we don't do that in business very much, right? We should, we should say, I don't like the person you just hired. He is annoying. And we don't want to work with you anymore. What usually happens is you just don't get the contract again and you never find out why. You never find out the new guy you hired is, 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 is off-putting and annoying, right? So those are the kind of hard conversations you have to have on a regular basis and the trust you have to have to be able to make that work. Mm. And so, again, like Lowe's and NASA, who would have ever thought Lowe's and Maiden Space, who's been acquired by, by a company called Redwire, um, would work together uh, to put a 3D printer in space. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But if you take a step back and you think about the strategic narrative of it, Lowe's is in the business of providing stuff to people in the fastest, best way possible for their homes. The astronauts happen to live in space. So if we can figure it out there, it does make sense. It makes perfect mm -hmm. sense, actually, why we would want to do that. But on the surface, it just seems like, whoa, I can't believe that that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you kind of know you're in a good spot, because guess what? Your competitors probably aren't talking to those folks. And that's it, a great exactly. way to go and to yeah. get, get new stuff, new ideas. Yeah, stuff. and that's, that's really connected to, like, collaboration, right? Like, how do you actually collaborate? People use the word a lot, but... Yeah they don't have enough trust and they're not willing to kind of let their guard down and let people in. Right. And they still are, have that, they, they don't have that win-win a mindset. Right. 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 That if I win, you win. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there's a huge part. So, and it's also counter to corporate culture, right? So where you like want to mm -hmm. have everything like lawyered up and leveled up. And even if you think about too, um, probably the companies you've worked for, if you go and you work with the startup, or a small company, maybe it's like a two-person shop or like a three-person or four-person shop with hardly any money. What's the first thing that big companies give them? They give them a big 40-page MSA that they would give to IBM and say, go and do this, go and get insurance, go and do all this stuff. And they're like, we have like $2,000 in our bank account. Um, we don't have the, this, this, this contract will destroy us before we even kind of get going, right? So we don't, we, we don't, we don't, we don't like start with trust. And it doesn't mean being foolish. There's a way to pare that down. So like at Lowe's, for instance, we went from a 42-page MSA down for the company, smaller companies we were working with. We went down to a four-page, very simplified, mm -hmm. uh, very friendly um, MSA. And that allowed – think about all the, the cost savings on the lawyer side. Just just that alone for these poor poor folks so that they could get through, through the process and then we could start to work together. And so there's like all these things. If you start to break it down and think about it again, like kind of a behavioral science way, it's not just the outcome we're desiring. Yeah. It's the whole mm. process needs to get cleaned up. Uh, so that we yeah, get to our desired state. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, you know, where I talk about like agile leadership, you know, one of the core principles of agile is people over process yet in corporate, like we stick to our processes and our processes are clunky and they slow down innovations, especially when it comes to collaboration with, with startups. Um, mm -hmm. As now I'm on this journey, working a lot with startups and trying to kind of uh, get them together with uh, corporates and the one, you know, the lead time is so long. Uh, we don't know who the decision maker is and then their processes are just so clunky. So cool. um, and, and the startups, like they don't have the resources to deal with that. So it's really being able to look at, okay, what's, um, what, what's really the value here? Can we not apply the same process, the standard process for every single problem that you have? Um, so another question for you is, oh, the time is going by so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and also just for people who are watching live, there's some people joining here, feel free to ask any questions. Um, 
you know, a lot's happened since you last, uh, since you wrote that book, uh, 2018. The world has changed drastically. Yeah, a couple of times. So, yeah, in many different ways. Um, so it would be great to hear your perspective a little bit on, you know, what have you learned in the past four years in the pandemic that has informed you not only just on this um, building these narratives and how we need to think differently about our KPIs, but how we actually drive transformation. What have we learned? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so, so it's a huge question. So I would say number one is I, I think that there has been a huge awakening um, or maybe, maybe it's not an awakening, but maybe a stirring in people that they're realizing that like we talked about at the beginning that, what they're working on is maybe not what they want their life to be about. And your work is not your life, all that stuff. But there's so much time you spend doing your job. So you should, you don't have to love it. There are parts, everyone has parts of the job that they don't like. But there's, you're, you sh you're the goal, the mission should be bigger than again, something small that doesn't bring any kind of fulfillment or, or get you to your, your goal. The other part of it too is what I find is that People are too individually focused and not thinking about the units that they're in. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's great to have individual goals. Those are critical. But if you're in a family, mm. one surefire way to make sure you're unhappy is that your individual goals are not communicated or not congruent or not, not tied into your family goal. And, and those, the, the individuals in a family, whether they're, uh, we have a two-year-old and a 10-year-old, right? Those, those individuals have goals. Um, our little guy, he doesn't, he doesn't know exactly that's what the I, but we we uh, we put goals on him right that he he could do, and then my wife too, and the, those things have to come together. And again, so much of it is not just like putting everything in this business world pocket. What I do at work, and this is what I do for myself, and this is what I do for my family. It's all together. And I think the work from home thing really showed that it is just kind of all together. And if you're unfulfilled in one area, it will not just stay there. It will bleed over to the other areas. And it's time to think about them in a holistic way. And the only way that I really think you can do that is by having a strategic narrative for yourself and for your family. And if you can't do that, then, then there's, there's a bigger issues at play probably. Um, but if you have that and you can go to that, it really makes it so easy when opportunities show up to say, we're going to do this, even though it means a pay decrease or gone, or we're, we're going to move to this place uh, or we're not because it doesn't get us to our goal. It makes it so much easier than just being like, what are we going to do? I don't know. And that also can, can destroy. So we're seeing these things kind of play out at a macro scale. And we see the same issues play out with organizations too. And um, organizations that thought that they maybe had another five, 10 years on the digital transformation path, they got smacked upside the head as soon as COVID showed up and they continue to. I think so many organizations probably like you too, not like I talk to these, they're like kind of the implicit question is like, when is this all going to end? And you're like, it's not. <laughs> this is this is the easy part. It's going to get steeper. This is this is not. People aren't going to decide one day that oh, you know, let's just go back to how it was five years ago. Their expectations are just growing. They're not shrinking. So organizations need to get it together too. Yeah. So yeah. all of it together. The other the other part I just want to say too is so when I left Lowe's, one of the reasons I left Lowe's was to do what we were doing at Lowe's, but for other organizations which we do at SU. But um, one of the big things was I was really really focused on what a huge problem learning was. So learning is so critical to every single thing that doesn't matter if you're young, if you're old, and especially in the business setting, it is so broken. It is so broken. And so mm -hmm. how do we fix learning? And so one of the things that I left to do was to create a, uh, a neuroadaptive and adaptive learning, a VR learning uh, system. And so where we do that, it's called Pioneer. Um, and, uh, and basically, you use bioadaptive sensors, so EEG and eye tracking, and then it, uh, the VR environment adapts to what's going on in your brain to make it less hard, more hard, and to maintain uh, learning outcomes. This is about eight times mm -hmm. more effective than a best one-to-one -one teaching. Um, wow. So we have lo really large uh, organizations that I can't say the names of, uh, but, uh, yeah. but, but that are using it. And it's been really exciting to see that all play out. And so for me, leaving, huh. one of the reasons I left is because I was so focused on learning. I thought learning was a huge problem, a huge opportunity, but also was worth leaving this great place that I was working at with these great people I was working at to go and tackle these problems. So that's what I would say. I would say it's, it's just the same thing. It's just become wow. more acute. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so two, two things, I guess, before um, we close out here. One, I would love to actually learn a little bit more 
um, from you, like maybe step by step on how would I do this exercise with my spouse and with my family, for example, in terms of um, goal setting um, and narrative building? What what kind of time horizon do you think about? Can you break it down for us? Yeah. So what I so there's there's two sides. So one is on the company side. Um, there's really three, there's three pieces. One is you have to have strategic narrative. That strategic narrative should be 10 years out. And there's more stuff online. If you look me up that I will explain that. Then you have to break bottlenecks in your company and then you have to create new KPIs. For the family side, it's far more simplistic um, Mm -hmm. because it's less rigorous. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what we do in our family is in January 1st, we write, it's just an exercise. We don't actually send it out. It's a, it's Mm -hmm. write the Christmas card for the next year. So you know how you get these Christmas cards and they're like, and Billy did this and, and then, and, you know, and then, and then Javier did that. And, and, and that's all like cute and whatever. But the idea is then it doesn't matter what age we are, you know, I'm uh, uh, dad and mom and the kids, whatever age they are, they can think about what would they want on the Christmas card to say about what they did that year. And we write it down and then we have, then we turn those things into goals. And then as things show up and as opportunities show up, like, should, you know, our daughter, Alice, should she go and she do horseback riding lessons? Well, that's going to take this much commitment. And there's a, there's a sacrifice of time for this other thing that maybe she wanted to do or not do. And then we weigh it out and say, well, let's go back to the Christmas card. What is, what did the narrative say for this year? Uh, what we were going to do. And then it's like, oh yeah, well that doesn't really fit. Or maybe it does. Yeah, and yeah. that allows us to make really fast trade-offs as a family. And I find that's a very simple exercise that everyone can understand. Um, yeah. And then doing it every year. Really yeah, important. I'm gonna try try doing that. And then, do you do kind of individual narratives per family member, and then a joint one for the family? Because you you talked about sort of um, integrating all of that, and and that's something you know I I don't do. Um, yeah. Often when I'm making decisions, I'm thinking so individualistically when I know it's gonna have an impact um, right. on and then the entire family. And we're somehow trained to think this way that you know it's it's just only our needs and that's what matters, and that we un- undervalue the impact of those around us and how 100%. we do is going to impact them and how it's going to impact us. Totally. And I think we also underestimate the intelligence of our children um, mm-hmm. to be able to see and understand and to future look for themselves, like even at a very young age, right? Um, have their ability to do that is remarkable. Also to the insight that they have on you as parents is also remarkable. Like we all have these things where like you see your kid doing something you're like, why are they doing that? Oh, they're copying what I'm seeing, but like in a weird way, right? Where they're like moving pots and pans. They'll do that too in a narrative and it's fascinating and it gives you a different insight into what it is that you want to do. Um, and that's super, super important. The other thing that's really critical too, especially for kids, is that it put you, you are, you are intentionally saying to them, you should be the main character in your story. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And if you are not the main character in your story, there's something wrong there. Now, the main character in the story doesn't just go around doing selfish things. They go around helping people, right? So you're not turning, I, the goal is to not turn in everybody into a bunch of narcissists. We have enough of that, I think, in this generation. But, 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 but to really make them feel like they have some control and ownership over what they're doing and, and some effect in it, even within the family, I think it's really important. And I've seen that in my daughter. Um, so she feels that she has that, that ownership over her life, you know? Yeah. And, and what a good sort of system to start building early on that can stick with them. Um, you know, I, I wish I had, I had that system when I was in college, when I first graduated, there's so many things that we're, we're not taught about. And, um, it's, 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 it's a great way for us to start getting organized early on and start thinking about our goals and what's important to us. So I love that. I love bringing those the narrative thinking that you learned from experimenting with customers at Lowe's and bringing that back home. Because if it works there, why wouldn't it work for us as a family? Right? Because we're all um, people. Yeah, we're all people. We're all people, and it's all it's all about people. So thank you so much, Kyle. This was such a fascinating, inspiring, and um, knowledge full of knowledge conversation for all of us um hopefully um and we learned a lot about building narratives how to how to think about kpis that are not you know kpis for um mature kpis as you call them but future kpis um how we can um think differently about learning and how we can set goals for ourselves um as a family i think um all of us can take that away with us thank you so much for joining And we hope to bring you back on here again. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks.